is the Trail of the Ice Age Blues, a film from the Planet of Man series. This lake and these rocks owe their shape to the movement of ice over them. From about three million years ago, a long time ago, until less than 20,000 years ago, the whole of this territory, and indeed most of Canada and the northern United States, were covered with thick ice, two miles thick, like Greenland and Antarctica are covered with ice today. And the slow movement of this ice over the land scraped off the soil and the loose rock and rounded the forms of the islands and gouged out the lakes. So it was the presence of this great ice age that shaped Canada as it is today. The ice was here, not long ago. In vast sheets it flowed, rearranging the old forms into new, changing the earth with irresistible force. I scraped away the country's past, made sweeping modifications. Now look, we're living in the midst of glacial transformations. Today, the ice has gone. This immense force of change was itself changed, melted to near extinction with the return of warmer summers. And of the great mountain glaciers that once moved through the western ranges, gouging out the valleys and sculpturing the peaks, now but a few remain at high altitudes, where summer is cold and short. They wait like mastodons at bay for winter's sure arrival. When heavy snow falls, we'll provide food for their survival. But it was the great ice sheets that overwhelmed the continents whose trail is indelibly carved to the landscape of North America. Today, their memory is preserved in Greenland 
and in some isolated remnants on Arctic islands. The Greenland ice sheet, fed by heavy snowfall, its glaciers move to the sea at up to 60 feet a day. Such an advance could, in time, bury a continent. But Greenland leads a separate life. Its ice is far from lazy. It does a rapid island tour and ends up in the Navy. Drifting south, the Greenland icebergs melt in the warming waters of the Atlantic. Each year, the warmth of summer creates an invisible barrier to the advancing ice. But a time came when winter stayed, and the ice continued its advance. snow fell during the cold months of the year and the sun could melt during the short summer. Year by year, as the snow deepened, its own weight compacted the lower layers into ice. As the depth of ice increased, its weight exerted enormous pressure outwards in all directions. Thus, the ice began to move. As the snow continued to accumulate, the outward movement persisted. Over two miles thick in places, the immense bulk of ice inched forward, eroding the land in its path. Picking up soil and rocks, plucking huge boulders from the bedrock, 
Under the weight of the ice above, these boulders gouged across the Canadian shield, smoothing it like a giant file and milling the rock like flour. The ice fanned out from Labrador in BC far away. The ice sheets covered all our land and half the USA. The ice advanced fingering its way forward in lobes that reached first through the low-lying river valleys and lake basins, gouging and deepening them as it moved. It carved out the valleys, deepening and widening them, steepening their sides until they became U-shaped. Finally, the lobes of ice converged into a single awesome front. The land was locked beneath a barren waste of ice and snow. When fully grown, the ice sheets covered all of Canada and the United States as far south as the Ohio and Missouri rivers. The weight of the ice was immense. The vast load bowed down the land beneath it depressing it by as much as several hundred feet. The ice had journeyed far in time. It robbed the land it crossed. It ripped it off and smoothed it out, held all the land had lost. scraped away the country's past and made sweeping modifications and spread white signs all across the land, marked closed for alterations. Thousands of years of continuous winter, finally broken by periodic spells of warmth. Slowly, very slowly, the ice sheets begin to melt in the heat of newfound summers. First in the south, where the ice was thinnest, the melting was quicker in the short warm spells than the advance in the still lingering cold. recession had begun. But the cold was not easily thwarted, and after warm periods of recession, cold periods of advance returned again and again. With the melting of the ice, the glacier deposits the material it gathered and tumbled beneath it while moving across the continent. This material is called till, or boulder clay. It is a mixture of particles of all sizes from finest clay through silts, sand, and pebbles to boulders as large as a house. Till is a significant feature of glaciated areas. Each time warmth waned and the ice again advanced, it pushed and molded its earlier deposits of till. When the climate warmed and the ice receded, meltwater washed, sorted, and redeposited the till as clay, silt, sand, and gravel, reworking the ground over which it flowed. The process was erratic and variable, but the retreat of ice left a trail of deposits in new forms upon the land. Deposits that the glacier left all have the weirdest names. 
Like drumlins, canes, and kettles, eskers, and moraines. Terminal moraines are long raised ridges, some more than 200 feet high and miles wide. They are formed of till, dropped in heaps and thrust into position by the leading edge of a glacier acting like the blade of a giant bulldozer. A terminal moraine marks the farthest point of an advance or halt of the ice front during the general recession. Unceremoniously dumped in position, it displays an irregular stony terrain of knobby hills and undrained depressions. But if it's your misfortune, friend, to farm upon this land, your blue plate special will be rocks served up with tons of sand. Not too much you can do with it, really. Just too damn much trouble pulling a tractor and plow over it. Not worth the effort. Better to seed it down, let the cattle eat the grass. Nope, man couldn't raise umbrellas on this land. Just trees and cows, cows and trees. Neither of them too fussy about where they grow. Drumlin, a Celtic word meaning little hill. Drumlins are formed beneath the ice. The moving ice sculptures the till beneath it into these smooth, whale-shaped forms. They range in size from barely perceptible swellings to mounds 200 feet in height, up to a mile in length. When there are several grouped together, they provide an attractive topography called a basket of eggs. The ice piled up this oval hill Shaped it, slipping past it But took no gamble when it put Its drumlins in one basket Since drumlins usually consist of a sandy clay till They offer good loamy agricultural soil Where streams of dirty meltwater leave the edge of the glacier, they here and there deposit gravel, sand, and silt in nearly level beds. Extensions of these deposits, called outwash plains or terraces, sometimes cover broad valley bottoms. Their nearly level bedding and their flat surfaces are often interrupted with the scattering of depressions, some dry and others containing bogs or even lakes. These Kettles, as they are called, are the result of residual ice blocks, which, when finally melted, leave depressions. In other places, these streams of meltwater eroded their channels, producing deeply incised spillways. These old spillways may often be traced for long distances. When an ice front halts and stagnates for a time, the coarse gravels and sands carried down by the water accumulate in irregular piles that rise to considerable heights, their sides buttressed by the ice. When the glacier resumes its retreat, they collapse, forming high, sandy, conical mounds that are called canes. Canes consist of chaotic beds of sand and gravel. Occasionally, successive canes form an extended ridge of mounds called 
a came terrace. The Kames were prone to settling down. They didn't fancy travel. So when the eyes pulled out, they say, Big Sand Hills full of gravel. I don't know much about this ice age, but it's sure fine gravel for road building. Now, if a glacier brought this whole load down here, well, it deserves a bonus. Hey, what do I call for another load? Oh, well, I'll find out. Meltwater flows over the glacier and finds its way through tunnels beneath the melting ice. It deposits gravel and sand in these sinuous passages, which, when the ice retreats, remain as meandering ridges called eskers. They stand up to 100 feet in height and can wander, as some of the longest ones do, for tens and even hundreds of miles across the land. Like the Kames, they are valuable sources of sand and gravel. The great sheets of glacial ice formed effective dams that blocked the natural drainage routes through much of the continent. As a result, many high-level glacial lakes were formed when the ice was melting. Throughout the long period during which the ice was receding, the configuration of the glacial lakes and drainage channels often shifted. But when a lake remained stable for some time, wave action built gravel beaches and cut terraces terminating in bluffs around its shores. The rhythmic, abrasive action of the waves rounded the pebbles and evenly graded the gravel of these ancient beaches that stand up as smooth strands with flat tops. In these ancient lakes, sand and silt settled out to form deltas, which after the lakes drained, remain as silty lake plains. These give way further out in the lake basins to clay plains. During the summers, when the glaciers were melting and the spillways active, bringing in a fresh supply of sediments, the lakes were constantly churned by currents. The larger particles settle first to the bottom, forming these coarser and light-colored silty layers. Each year, winter's return halted the streams of meltwater, and the lakes became still. Beneath their carapace of winter ice, the finer clay particles then settled from the water to form dark clay layers overlying the lighter bands of silt. This process often continued for many years, producing stratified beds called varved clays that are now found on the flat plains that once lay beneath lakes. The annual couplets of these varved clays are a means of counting the years needed for their formation. The sediments of glacial lakes for carefully settled are put there for geologists who wish to count the season. 1,330, 1,331. While many of these great post-glacial lakes have shrunk or vanished, countless others persist. Carved by the movement of ice over the bedrock of the Canadian Shield, uncounted thousands, perhaps millions of these deep, clear lakes still lie scattered over northern Canada and other glaciated lands, evidence on the trail of the retreating ice. I scooped out holes upon the shield, the 
this force called glaciation and doing so unwittingly encouraged red creation the ice has gone retreated What few remnants remain in mountains and the high Arctic await their final demise or rebirth to advance once more. Since 1940, the mean temperature of the world has indeed been falling. Many scientists are now predicting the coming of a new age of ice. But no one really knows. For the moment, we wait. Living in the trail of the glaciers, or perhaps in their future path. The glaciers have done their work and gone back from where they came. But who will run to welcome them if they come back again? The ice brought all these rocks some time ago, just dumped them down. It's gone now. Some say it's gone for good, but you gotta wonder. Could be, it's just gone back for another load. The question in the mind of the farmer at the end of the film you've just seen is clearly a very interesting one, if, if not important. 
Has the ice retreated simply to advance again and to bring with it another load, as the farmer put it, or have we seen the last of the ice age? The possibilities, the two possibilities, are very important ones for our culture, for our civilization. They won't affect us, but they may very well affect generations ahead in 50 or perhaps 100,000 years. The two possibilities lead to the following consequences. Either the ice will ad advance and North America, for example, and Northern Europe may be inundated with just as much ice as they were uh, 15,000 years ago, or the ice may continue to melt, the ice and the ice caps of Antarctica and Greenland, raising sea level, albeit very slowly, but nevertheless raising sea level, and some of our coastal cities may be drowned. They're not so very far off in geological terms, one of those two possibilities. Well, in order to answer that question, we need to know something about the origin of ice ages. What causes ice ages? And perhaps right from the start, one ought to say that we really, as yet, don't know exactly what causes ice ages. But there are a number of factors that we do understand that may be part, at least, of the cause of ice ages. And we'll have a look at some of those in the next half hour. Now, first of all, what do we know about climatic changes? Because clearly, glaciation, the advance of ice, has something to do with climatic changes. Well, there's good historical evidence over the last thousand or so years, 1,500 years, of climatic changes which have been quite substantial. For example, between about 400 AD and about 1200 AD, the climate was relatively mild, and there was very little sea ice between Greenland and Iceland. And it's at that time that the voyages of the Vikings took place, because the sea was free from ice. But between 1200 and 1400, there was something of a cooling, and ice became more frequent, and voyages became more difficult, and that's recorded in the Viking sagas. Between 1400 and about 1550, uh, things began to warm up again, but then between 1550 and 1850 came what's often been called the Little Ice Age. Things got very, very much colder. And, for example, we can see this in the advance of glaciers in the Alps. The Rhone Glacier, for example, was very, very much farther down the valley than it is in this photograph, which was taken uh, just a few years ago. In this photograph, the glacier is right up on the shoulder of the mountain. But in 1850, at the end of the Little Ice Age, that glacier was way down in the valley, and in fact, it was quite a tourist attraction. And the slight warming up, which has succeeded, since 1850 until, in fact, just about 20 years ago, was responsible for the melting back of the Rhone Glacier. Now, as was mentioned also in the film, since 1940, there seems to have been a general cooling down. So we have evidence then from historical records. We have evidence from uh, the Romans, for example, were able to grow grapes in Britain, something that uh, the British can't do at the moment. In fact, the most northerly grapes in Europe at the moment are still about 300 miles south of the coast of Britain. So there's a whole complex, a uh, whole multitude of historical observations which go to show that in the last 2,000 years there have been quite major climatic changes which have affected commerce and uh, migrations of peoples from, for example, Iceland to Greenland and so on. Um, Another one that's quite interesting, if we can perhaps put that in. Uh, the ice was so far advanced during the Little Ice Age that, in fact, Eskimos were able to land on the northern coast of Scotland. They came along the sea ice, the edge of the sea ice, which was then only a couple of a hundred miles north of Scotland. That's perhaps one of the most astonishing of the, uh, the effects of the, the Little Ice Age. Few people in Scotland would now expect to be visited by Eskimos that came by kayak. But um, enough, of, enough of history. Um, <clears throat> what else do we know about the Ice Ages? Well, we know that the Ice Age, which we may just have seen the end of, or we may still be in the middle of, was not simply one great advance 
of ice from the north and then a melt back um, <clears throat> from to, toward, the, toward the north. In fact, we know from studying glacial deposits that there were at least four advances of the ice and subsequent retreats, and we're in one of those retreats. Uh, the ice apparently began to form about two million, perhaps two and a half million years ago. And the first advance lasted until about 1,700,000 years ago. And then following that were, uh, was a retreat and a further advance of ice lasting perhaps 300, 400,000 years, and then a retreat, an advance, and a retreat. So there's a pattern of advances and retreats to the last ice age. And that's an important fact that we must take into account if we're to explain ice ages. Um, <clears throat> another observation has to do with the frequency of ice ages. Is the ice age of the last two million years a normal geological occurrence, or is it something unusual in the history of the Earth? Well, it's relatively unusual. We have means of spotting the occurrence of ice ages in the past. We can recognize the deposits that were left behind by the ice. For example, at Elliott Lake, one of the road cuts that you in the area probably know quite well, is of ice age deposits left behind by a Precambrian glaciation. The rock of this road cut looks like a pudding, a pudding with large pebbles of granite in it, in fact, pink granite. In this specimen, gathered with some labor from that very same rock cut, you can see the granite pebbles and boulders quite easily. The ground mass, which is dark around them, is composed of sand and mud. And that kind of mixture of sand and mud with boulders of various sizes scattered within it is quite typical of glacial deposits. You can see it all around you at the present day, um, around Sudbury and around all of northern Ontario, are quite thick, extensive sheets of that kind of rather messy, mixed up melange of boulders and sand and mud. They were left by the last glaciation, but the specimen from Elliott Lake is not a specimen of glacial debris from the last glaciation, but from a glaciation in the Precambrian. In fact, a glaciation of about 2,200 million years ago. Now, that's one of the first glaciations of which we have a record. There were further glaciations in the Precambrian, one of them about 900 uh, million years ago, and then in the Paleozoic, in the Ordovician, for example, and also in the Permian and the Carboniferous, a glaciation that you remember was evidence of the former union of the continents of Gondwana land. But since that time, since that Permian Carboniferous glaciation on Gondwana land, there were none, or there is no trace of them in the geological record anyway, until we come to our present or just past glaciation of two million years ago. So the conclusion we can draw from that is that conditions have been right for glaciation in the past, but it's a very unusual geological occurrence. So the summary then of what we have to account for when we account for glaciations is we must account for their rarity in the geological record. And they're apparently sporadic occurrence, this great gap of 300 million years before our present glaciation, for example. We have to account for that. In other words, a long-term change of some kind. Then we also have to account for those relatively short-term changes of hundreds of thousands of years that we found when we looked at the pattern of glaciation within our own last ice age, the advance and the retreat the advance, retreat, advance again, and so forth. We must account for those changes. Now, there have been many theories put forward to account for them. Let's, let's begin with the relatively short-term changes. What sort of things might affect or might produce short-term changes in the climate of the Earth? Well, one of the areas of speculation has to do with the position of the Earth relative to the Sun. That's 
in this model see the sun here and this the earth now the earth moves around the sun in this kind of fashion with the axis of rotation of the earth pointing toward the sun if you like this is the axis of rotation the earth moves around like that so for example the north pole receives sunlight for 24 hours during the winter when the top of the earth if you like the north part of the earth is pointing toward the sun so that's in in simple terms the position of the earth as it goes around the sun an inclined axis and going around the sun in a circle you can see the same thing on this diagram here this the earth with the tilted axis and this the summer situation with rays from the sun illuminating the north pole 24 hours a day and the earth then through the seasons through fall and through winter moves around the sun in the winter situation the north pole is in darkness for 24 hours a day as the earth rotates on its inclined axis and then in the spring situation back to summer now if that were the simple picture the simple rotation of the earth around the sun and that were constant then everything would be easy but it doesn't stay constant the orientation of the earth toward the sun and the position of the earth toward the sun change one of the major changes is an alteration in the orientation of the axis of the earth the axis around which the earth rotates we can see that in this diagram the axis of the earth that is the south to north poles presently points to the north star but just like a wobbling top every 13,000 years the axis of the earth changes and points an equal amount in the opposite direction and this would be the north star in 13,000 years time and 13,000 years after that the situation would be back to normal so on the simple situation that we looked at first with summer here in the northern hemisphere in june in 13,000 years with the axis in the opposite direction we'd have winter in june now those or that is one major change in the orientation of the earth there's a second change which takes place and that has to do also with the axis of rotation of the earth but has to do with the angle of the axis of rotation the maximum angle is 24 and a half degrees from what would be a vertical north south and the minimum is 21 and a half degrees the angle at present is tilted about 23 and a half degrees and that change from a maximum to a minimum takes place about every 20,000 years now the importance of those changes in position is that the summers need to be cold in order for the snow which fell during the winter not to melt and to have a chance to build up to form an ice sheet and those two circumstances plus another one combine to produce the cold summers that we need for the advance of glaciers that other change in position of the earth is that the earth doesn't in fact go around the sun in a perfect circle the sun is not at the center of the orbit uh, of the earth there's a long axis at present of 94 and a half million miles and that occurs during our summer and there's a short axis of about 91 and a half million miles so the earth's orbit is eccentric and it becomes even more eccentric than it is at present about every 92,000 years and moreover 
the long axis becomes the short axis of the eccentric orbit every 108,000 years. Now, that all sounds very complicated, and it's difficult to remember the figures and just what's going on. But the sum total that we want in order to produce a cool summer in the northern hemisphere, in order for the summer snow, or for the summer not to melt the winter snow, is we need the summer to be when the Earth is far from the sun. We need it, the axis, to have a small inclination toward the, toward the sun. And at that stage, the summers will be cool, and we'll have a chance to preserve the winter snow. So one can calculate how often those circumstances are likely to occur. And a mathematician called Milankovitch did exactly that. And there seems to be some correspondence between the times when those favorable circumstances for preservation of snow during the summer in the northern hemisphere, some coincidence to the actual observed advances of the ice during our last ice age. Now, there's much disagreement about this. It depends on dating of the advances. It depends on calculations and so forth. But there seems to be some agreement. And we may, in the position and the orientation of the Earth vis-a-vis -vis the sun, have some reason or some cause for major climatic changes, the kinds of climatic changes we want to occur on the 10 or the 100,000 year scale. But we have a problem with the long-term changes. And in order to solve the problem with the long-term changes, we have to look at the distribution of the oceans and the continents. At the South Pole, the continent of Antarctica, which is glaciated, lies in an interesting position. It's right over the pole. There is the outline of the continent of Antarctica, covered by two miles of ice. Now, Antarctica didn't become glaciated until about 16 million years ago. And we can date the glaciation by a in very interesting fashion, in fact by looking at the way in which the small shells of our little floating organism, very, very tiny shells, which way they're coiled. When the climate was cold, the shells coiled in a left-hand spiral. When the climate was warm, they coiled in a right-hand spiral. And by looking at the age of the sediments around the coast of Antarctica, we can spot a considerable cooling down of the water about 16 million years ago. And that, we think, uh, was the time of the start of the glaciation of Antarctica. Now, why did it wait, or why did it not occur before 16 million years ago? Well, the last major event which affected Antarctica was the movement of away of Australia. Here is Australia now. But about 50 million years ago, this ocean that's in between didn't exist. And it seems that the conditions for the glaciation of Antarctica only occurred after Australia had moved away from Antarctica. And that gives us a clue as to the kind of position a landmass must be in in order to be glaciated. It must be in a high latitude. Antarctica is right at the South Pole. It must be surrounded by water surrounded by water because it's from the water by means of um, <clears throat> the picking up of water from, from, from by the air and the snowfall on Antarctica, the consequent snowfall from that open water that the snow comes. And we have confirmation of the need for the landmass to be surrounded by open water if we look at the opposite pole of the Earth. If we look at the continent in the northern hemisphere, which is presently glaciated, that of Greenland, which is here. Now, around the coast of Greenland, there are rocks quite clearly visible. But it's just a small rim of rock. 
And in the interior of Greenland, just like in Antarctica, there's a very thick pancake of ice, also more than a mile thick. The conditions under which Greenland has been glaciated are very similar to those of Antarctica. Greenland is obviously also in a high latitude. It's very far to the north. And it's also got a considerable extent of open water around it, the North Atlantic. But the Arctic Ocean, which is here, which would be the body of water, which would supply the precipitation for the glaciation of North America and Europe, that ocean is frozen. And there is, it seems, a not a sufficient body of open water for there to be a supply, a sufficient supply of precipitation in the form of snow to build up glaciers in northern Europe and northern Canada at the present time. It's quite cold enough. Anybody who's worked or lived in the Arctic will know that. But there isn't sufficient snow, and that seems to be because the Arctic Ocean is frozen over. Then why did we get a glaciation, or periods of glaciation, at least four, during the last two million years? Well, it may be because the Arctic Ocean was then open. And the reason that the Arctic Ocean was opened, in other words, melted, may be because the link between South America, let me just get this stable, the link between South America and North America, this connection of Central America, only arose due to volcanic activity about three, maybe three and a half million years ago. And the effect of that was to drive warm water from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up the Atlantic into the North Atlantic to warm the British Isles and to possibly melt the ice of Antarctica. So the initiation of the ice age of two million years ago in the northern hemisphere, our and Europe's ice age, may have to do with the, the distribution of ocean currents caused by a change in the pattern of land masses, caused by a change in the link between North America and South America. So ocean currents, the position of continents relative to open water is probably the key to glaciation. Now, why did the glaciers retreat? Well, after the Arctic Ocean was opened, a considerable amount of snow fell in North America. That snow would reflect the sun's heat. The climate became very cold, and initially that helped the, the glaciers expand, expand beyond the Canadian border into, North, into the United States, for example. But once it became so cold that the oceans became cold, then the Arctic Ocean froze over again. And what happened then? Then when the Arctic Ocean froze over, no open water, not sufficient snow, melted during the summer, the glaciers retreated. So that's just a theory. It may not be correct. But it gives us a hint that what is necessary for glaciation to occur is that we need a cold body of open water toward the north or the south, in other words, in a high latitude, and we need the land mass to be in a high latitude. So continental drift, the movement of continents toward the north, toward the south poles, an open body of water close to them are probably the conditions we need for glaciation. And it seems that we are going to suffer recurrent glaciations until continental drift moves the continents around again. Now, one of the effects of the last glaciation was, of course, to drive animals and plants out of their normal habitats. We often think of the mammoths, for example, the mammoths of North America. From one of them, about 15,000 years ago, came this rather beautiful tusk. We think of them being um, <clears throat> suffering extinction because of the advance of the ice. In fact, that was not the case. The mammoths and the other beasts of the Ice Age survived all the advances of the ice 
But what they didn't survive was they didn't survive the coming of man, man as a hunter. The mammoth which lost that tusk might have seen sites similar to this in North America 12 to 15,000 years ago. In fact, however, this is the coast of Antarctica at the present day. The rock of most of the continent is depressed by the weight of ice below sea level, but mountains along the coast jut out spectacularly just as they do along the coast of Greenland. Much of our understanding of how ice sheets grow and melt back will come from the study of the Antarctic ice sheet, and in fact already has come from the Antarctic ice sheet. It's hardly more than 65 years since the expedition of Captain Scott made their heroic attempt to reach the South Pole, the last three survivors dying not 20 miles from safety on the return from the pole. That expedition pioneered the scientific work now done in the Arctic. Scott's camp still stands remarkably well preserved. The contents of the tins are still edible, and everything of Scott and his companions is still as they left it in 1911, refrigerated by the extreme climate. The scientific work they began has been continued by international cooperation of a remarkable extent. There are still no territories in the Antarctic claimed like countries were in the New World by imperialists from Europe. The territory is still divided um, according to investigative territories. It's difficult to imagine Ontario covered by a mile of ice. But it did happen about, oh, 20,000 years ago. And it may indeed happen again. And if it does happen again, uh, we may not be able to stop it. But at least by that time, geologists and climatologists might have learnt enough to understand why it's happened. This is TV Ontario, Channel 19 in Toronto, Channel 53 in Belleville. of beauty, the world of the imagination, the world of the arts. Art is at the very heart of culture, 
at the heart of men and women's search for meaning and self-expression. 